If you're looking for other answers, I still don't have them. But what I do have is a particular set of skills. Skills I've acquired over a very long career. Skills that make me a nightmare for people who mislead, misinform, or misrepresent the sports card industry. So if you don't do that, I'll let it go. But if you do, we're going to talk about you. This episode is brought to you by the great people over at Gradesaver Pro. Make sure you visit Gradesaverpro.com for all your card supply needs, including the Gradesaver Pro Pro Card Sleeve, the only sleeve with an attached pull tab, and the only sleeve I will use for my cards. And make sure when you check out, use code INVESTIGATOR. That will give you 25% off your entire order. And thanks again to the great people at Gradesaver Pro for our episode giveaway. After each episode, we will give away some of the great products from Gradesaver Pro. To be eligible, it's simple. Simply like and subscribe to the video. Leave a comment. And if you're randomly selected, we will be in touch and tell you the next steps. So congratulations to last episode's winners and good luck to you. With that, Ty, hit the music. Welcome everyone to another episode of the Sports Card Investigator Show. My name is Andy. I am the aforementioned Sports Card Investigator. And I figure I think we're going to see this video after the Sports Card Investigator Holiday Spectacular and probably before the first of the year. So I figured why not end the year right and bring on a very special guest, someone I am proud to call a friend, someone who was there for me from the very beginning when things got rough. He called and said, hey, Andy, come on my show. Let's talk. And from then, we've kind of hit it off. So without further ado, delay, I want to bring on my good friend, Carlos. There he is. Good evening. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I appreciate the kind words at the intro. I never court any danger or controversy whatsoever. I am as clean cut as they come. For people who do not know, um, probably six, seven months ago, I don't even know, it was uh, before we had the national, I did yep. a video that basically I was sharing my opinion on why I wasn't going to go to the national. But I did, did I think, Carlos, I think you would agree. I think the title was a bit clickbait and got people stirred up a bit on and you're like, why is this guy telling people not to go? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of a lot of um, part of the part of the reason why I, I, I had no problem. I, I think early on, like almost near the beginning of your channel, because I think I shouted you out in a video at some point right yeah. near the beginning. Yeah, um, because I like I appreciate anything that takes a more analytical approach. I appreciate anybody who does a little more thought into it just in general. So I'm try I try to be encouraging of that where I can because it's rare. <laughs> um, and, and and I joke with um, I joke with Dustin, personal finance dad, um, that I understand that it is it does limit your audience sometimes to mm -hmm. do that. Um, it is more digestible stuff. So I do longer form stuff, which hurts viewership. People can't stick around; they don't want to. And if you go a little bit deeper below the surface, it's like, well, you have to th wait. I have to think about stuff. Is there a test? Is this on the final exam? And then they click off. So I, I got appreciate. A lot of yeah, I got a lot. I, I think I and it's exactly right. I did a video in the beginning called um, and we could talk more about what got us into this a little bit. I want people to know exactly, you know, your background a little bit. But it was I think it was 10 things you have to ask a content creator before you listen to them or something mm -hmm. like that. And it was like 50 minutes or 55 minutes. I remember you came on and you said you were actually, you know, going to do something like this. But I you know, kind of took uh took the long the long video and yeah. uh, it was and i think from there uh, i sent you a message back and forth and then mm. we we struck up a, a friendship from from there so that was that was definitely the case speaking of dustin mm -hmm. um one of his three or four videos that were coming out today i saw he did a uh a fifty dollar did you see the psa came out and a, a lucky few people um got to uh be um submissions so basically they did they did like a surprise drop 
were uh, where you got to be in a queue system. And if you were lucky enough to be at the front of the queue, uh, you would get to do a handful. I believe I heard like five was the cap. Five. Five. Yeah. So so at the fifty dollar at a fifty dollar range. Um, and I forget what the cap is. Was it four ninety nine or nine ninety nine? This was nine ninety nine. It was yeah. funny because uh, in the video I did before, you guys will see this one. I talk about the 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 um, the grading and how you guys there's a formula to see if a card's worth it or not. But it was funny because I'm like, man, I have a couple cards that I would love to throw in there, but I don't want to spend the hundred bucks to get into the queue. I'm not going to spend the hundred and fifty. So about three weeks ago, I was at my mother's house in Florida, and she says she goes. Uh, she goes, I don't know if there's anything's in there, but in the attic, which all cards are kept in the attic, mm -hmm. um, there's a box that says baseball cards. So when I went up to the attic, there was a box that said baseball cards. I opened them up, and to my surprise, they were some of my dad's old baseball cards. Mm -hmm. So there was a one that I found, and I don't know anything about baseball. My baseball friend's out there. Carlos knows about baseball. Mm -hmm. Pepino Man, Cesar knows about baseball. Picker Jim knows about baseball. No, Ryan knows about th those guys that I've met that they know. I don't know anything about baseball, but I do know, which was kind of fun because it brought back memories. There were some cards that I found, um, and this was one of them. It's uh, that Ozzy Smith. Yep, some of the tops. Yeah, and I wanted to get it graded, so I'm going to send that in on my five-card submission. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was pretty cool. It's not in the best shape, but it's, it's not terrible at all. How's the centering? It's not awful. I would say maybe – 60 40 65 yeah. it's not the, it's not the centering is tough on those for whatever reason i have a complete set of the 79s and for whatever reason the centering is tough on some of those i remember when i was a kid um one of the uh they had um show and tell mm -hmm. and one of the kids brought in a um a sheet of baseball cards an uncut mm -hmm. sheet and i remember the kids were like they were <laughs> kind of like that's yeah um and this one I thought was really cool. This is for the baseball guys out there. 77. And this Mark the Bird Fidrich. Mm -hmm. And for those of you guys who don't know, Google him, look him up. I mean, this guy, he he actually passed away, unfortunately, in, a, in an accident. Um, and he, his career was cut short because of injuries. But the, the interesting thing about him was he would actually talk to the ball, mm -hmm. walk around the mound, don't let the groundskeepers come to touch the mound. He would – tell the ball where to go and he was he was really good when um you know when he was uh when he was around there's there's some other ones that that i found that were pretty cool but i figured that'd be the, but the, the cool thing is you know back in the day when people used to keep their cards safe they would keep them in these and then and then remember these the uh the old plastic okay yeah yeah <laughs> I was wondering if you had any of the bricks, the old uh, Lucite bricks. He had, I saw they did have one to screw down the, mm -hmm. the oh yeah, unbelievable. But so, so for those, I, I'm sorry to get off on a tangent, but for those of you who don't know Carlos, tell a little, tell my audience mm -hmm. a little bit about you and, and, and how you got involved into the content creating world. Sure. So here's the elevator pitch. The elevator pitch is that I started collecting in 1990, very early on, very young. I never took a break. The only thing that I had close to it was in uh, university when Beer Money took precedence, you know, as you do. But even then, I would still, I would still, you know, kind of peruse eBay a little bit, and I would grab a card or two, and I would just have it sent to the house. And then my parents would do me the favor of stockpiling the mail, and I would grab it. I only, I didn't have the budget to buy much, but I'd, I'd say, "Can you hold the envelopes for me?" Yeah, no problem. And in those days, we weren't worried about returns and stuff, so the, the mail would pile up a little bit. I'd go home, and then I'd cut through everything. So I kept collecting all the way through. So the good news for me is that meant I was always involved. I was always in the game, so to speak. But um, I had the YouTube channel probably going back years. I've had some videos that had done well in the previous iteration of the channel. But mm -hmm. towards the end of 2018, so it predates a lot of this stuff, is that I, I started uh, going in and I said, well, I'm going to do something with the channel. The channel had been dormant for maybe about five or six months or whatever. There was a gap there. And I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do with it. I go, well, I still kind of want to make some videos or do something. So towards the tail end, I go, well, why don't I just go back to sports cards? I know that inside and out, I know all kinds of stuff. Let me see what I can do. I started off doing a couple of breaking videos with some boxes because I go, oh, it gives me an excuse to open some boxes. So I was opening a lot of football in 2018. So if any of you guys remember the football, that was a Lamar, Sam Darnold, Baker oh, yeah. Mayfield, pretty good, uh, you know, you know, quarterback class. But the problem is I ended up with a little bit too much um, Josh Rosen and not enough Josh Allen. <laughs> a lot of Josh Rosen. 
if anyone needs Josh Rosen, I have <laughs> Josh Rosen, a lot of it, uh, but not enough Lamar and too much Sam Darnold. <laughs> so it, wrong direction. We, we went in the wrong direction. Uh, so luck wasn't my forte. Um, but not the same. It was fun. But I also realized it wasn't sustainable. It was one of those things like it was fun to do, but boxes is, are expensive. And it, even at that point, boxes are still expensive. So I, I, I applaud those that can do it. But then I said, okay, well, what else can I do? I still want to do some card stuff, so let's do that. So I go, okay, I'll just track my progress and things that I do. And then I started making videos where I will opine. I have opinions. Uh-huh. I've been in this a while. I have opinions. So I thought, I will share these opinions that I have. It's it's funny. Um, when I started doing this, and, and, and people that follow my channel know that um, – my son kind of talked me into doing it for a living. I would speak, uh, do lectures and consulting and stuff like that. And um, the reason I got into it was I just wanted to try to give information to people that it's not going to be your, you know, here are the five cards you should buy or this or that, just something that maybe would be a bit, little bit more informative for lack of better words. And I think that's what you, you do also. And, and I think that um, the kind of content that you're creating is, is important because it gives that that other side of the coin perhaps that a lot of the guys that are creating content are just regurgitating the same stuff over and over again maybe i said too much but yeah but i do think like if we if we just uh because it's i always try to walk a fine line between uh poking fun at it because i try to mm-hmm. good naturedly poke fun at it but one thing i told a lot of people and i and i'll reiterate it here there's nothing inherently wrong with the people that do the top five videos and whatever. Look, look, you want to do it, have at it. The views are there. So especially for quite a while, the views were there, if that's what you want to do. But then you end up being one of many inside of a pool, you know, a gigantic pool of folks that are doing the same thing. Going in a different direction means that you get to kind of call your shot and you get to kind of do it in a way you want because you're setting the standard of how you want to approach it. You're setting your own editorial content and you can make that decision instead of adhering to the rules of the land because a top five list is a top five list, regardless mm-hmm. of who gives it. Um, and then it becomes a matter of, did you do the digging and research or you're just a guy who guessed when times are good? Well, I don't, I'm not, I'm not bound to the current trends. So if I, because I'm talking in generalities and I'm, I'm talking, how do we figure this stuff out? I can talk about it, whether this, the market's up, the market's down or the market's stagnant. It makes no difference whatsoever. So I'm not bound by that. It makes no difference to me. And the analysis, I leave it to the people who have a passion for it. I do analysis for a living. If mm-hmm. I'm calculating for cards, I will do it. I will pull up the spreadsheets. I'll look at the data and I'll do all that. I'm not interested in taking you through it in a video. There's some, there's other people who already do that. And frankly, they probably do better than I do because they probably enjoy it more than I do. And they'd enjoy presenting it more than I do. No, I, I think, I think that's, I think that's a, that's a really good point. And I would say, I think that this hobby and it's, 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 there's no, I mean, there's no debate that what this hobby has gone through in the past two years since, uh, since COVID hit and everything else, it's just, it's a, it's a totally different animal than it was before that. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if that's a good thing. I don't know if that's a bad thing. I think we'll, we will, will, that's, that's a, a, something that has not been written yet, but what, again, I'll put your, your, your clairvoyant hat on Mm -hmm. from what you've seen over the past two years to where we are now, do you see it continuing on this path of maybe leveling off or some type of uh, consistency, or do you see um, it going one way or the other, either good or bad? Sure. So what I'll say is this, and a lot there are a lot of forces that are competing with each other in that space going forward. You've got the institutional money that wants to push up. Because when the Josh Lubers of the world, they talk about the fanatics money, a lot of what they're doing is based on the idea that they're hoping to expand and grow the market. It's likely, and this is just my prediction and I'll give it to you. I don't think they're going to succeed. Mm -hmm. Not that they won't make money. They will make money. What I think they're not going to succeed in is in expanding the market by multiples. They're thinking in the back of their mind will grow by multiples. And the truth is, I don't think that's ever been possible. I think people think that the market has grown by multiples. We've had an influx of people coming in. Right. But the point that I've made is that when we had the last national, it competed for the most attended national of all time. Mm -hmm. So yes, there was COVID. Yes, there was a, but COVID also meant there was a pent up demand. So we had all this, a perfect storm. We didn't break the record of 1991. I was around in 1991, 
the Toronto Expo that we that was in 1991 was the most attended Toronto Expo at that time. That's my our big national one up here. Mm -hmm. So we almost returned to 1991 levels of attendance. Now, the first thing they throw back at me is, oh, well, we got technology. We got this, that, and the other thing. It's like, you're right. We also had local card shops and we also had weekly card shows and monthly card shows. So we had other, we had other ways. Headcount is not the only indicator. My point is if we had no COVID, I snap my finger and it's gone. You're not going to get 400,000 people at the national. <laughs> they don't no. exist. Not enough people who are willing to actually travel to go to a show, even if they had the capacity, even if they had the hotels, even if I provide all the logistics where it's possible. Right. I don't think they're actually will that many people willing to do it. Yes, there's tons of demand, but it was also fueled by the money. So I think what's going to happen going forward is you're going to have a bit of a stagnation because as the prices went up, some people got priced out. And right. as the prices went up, some people got drawn in. But if the easy money goes away, some of those folks are going to go out of the system. The, the collectors, quote unquote, they think the flippers are going to get driven out. And I'm like, dude, in the 90s when I was collecting, the flippers were there. Yeah. <laughs> the margins were smaller, but the flippers right. were there. <clears throat> yeah, they're not going anywhere. No, it, it, you're going to reduce the number. And the ones that are there are probably going to be the savvier, the ones who have a more sound strategy and a more sound business, and they're willing to take more reasonable and moderate gains. They're not sitting there trying to four or five, 10 X in, you know, in a weekend. Um, but they'll still be there. They'll still buy at a certain price point and sell for more next time. Exactly. I like it too. I got, I have a lot of smart people that watch the show and they send me messages and someone really made a good point. They said they liken it to, do you remember, um, the poker, the online poker mm -hmm. craze. I made I've made that analogy. Go on. It's it's perfect. I mean, it is. it's like you're sitting at a table, and you got a bunch of fish, and like what was the old adage? If you look at a poker table and you can't figure out who the sucker is, it's, it's probably you, right? Mm -hmm. But it's like when that when that money left the online poker, then people actually had to start playing at a higher level, mm -hmm. and I think that's what we're seeing now. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's just going back to what we were doing before the craziness when every guess was correct. There was no strategy that did not work because everything was elevated. Everything was, you know, you buy a card on a Tuesday for three bucks, you flip it for seven. Well, that doesn't happen anymore, but that's not a bad thing, right? Mm -hmm. So can I extend that analogy and let me Absolutely. throw a couple of things? Uh, I think we're having a little bit of fun and, uh, uh, this will be after your holiday spectacular, but it consider is, this is. my early, consider this my early Christmas present to you guys. I'm going to drop a few exclusives that have never been thrown in to my live stream or any of my videos, but in the new year, you'll get more of this. So I'm going to give you a taste. I'll give you a little okay. taste. So first let me extend your analogy about the poker boom, because I've used the analogy of the poker boom to describe certain elements of it. Here's what people need to remember about the poker, boom, because poker is something that I've studied and paid attention to quite a bit, especially during the boom, because I was fascinated with the whole outcome. Right. So what happened with it is that the, it was the Chris Moneymaker effect because he was the one who won that World Series of Poker on ESPN that set the bar, the bar going. But it was, it was a perfect storm. Here's your Black Swan event if you want to bring it up later. So Absolutely. I'm going I'm to give you an opening to it as well. He won, but he won off an internet satellite at a young upstart site that was around Poker Stars, but it wasn't the player that it would become. But... All of a sudden, it, because the because the main event at the World Series of Poker was a ten thousand dollar buy in, and back in the day, and you guys will get the analogy that that I'm going to draw here. That's why I want to extend it for a second so you can envision mm -hmm. it. In the old days of the world of World Series of Poker, you need a ten thousand dollar buy in. Not everybody has that, or you need somebody to stake you. You know, there's a variety of different ways you can get it done, but you need ten sure. grand in order to play. Now that meant you probably were a better player on average. So. Does that mean you can be you can't be a winning poker player in those days? Absolutely not. The best of the best were consistently there towards the end, but it, on average, it was a higher skill level game. You needed to you couldn't you the variance was actually low. The best of the best were consistently there at the end towards the final table. Even if they weren't at the final table, they get close. The fields were smaller also, so in general, it was just a tougher field on average. What happened? Poker boom happened. All of a sudden, all that money is flushing in because you've got all these folks that are winning these satellites on Poker Stars and on, you know, Bet365 and a variety of different other sites that were opening up all over the place. You know, Ultimate Bet, which Hill, which doesn't exist anymore, they right. had their issues. Yeah. So you got all these, you got all these new poker sites cropping up left, right, and center. It's the Poker Boom, and it's on, you know, World Poker Tour is on TV, World Series of Poker, ESPN, everybody. It's all over the place. 
Here's what happens. The field balloons. It balloons overnight every single year that goes by. It was Chris Moneymaker, and then I think, uh, and then you had the guy, uh, Jeremy Gold or Jamie Gold. Jamie he was Gold. just some dude. And Jamie Gold was fun for me because he was actually a crappy poker player. His strategy was to tell the truth. He'd, right. bluff, he'd say, I'm bluffing, and then people wouldn't believe him, and he was bluffing. Or he'd say, I've got the cards, and people wouldn't believe him. And his strategy was to tell the truth because everybody was perplexed and confused. But then afterwards, he thought he was a genius. Mm -hmm. that's, that's another tangent. I, I could that's, speak on this for hours, but yeah. I'll, I'll wait. The point is, as the fields got bigger, the money got bigger. The prize payouts got bigger. But it meant the average player sucked. It meant that all of a sudden, the variance went through the roof because the, the better players had to sit at a table with a bunch of guys who would go all in with nothing because, right. they, because they figured they got nothing to lose, whatever. Right. I want it on a $10 satellite, so I'm losing. I'm not 10 grand in, I'm $10 in. And I got a free trip to Vegas out of the deal? This is awesome. All in. 7-2 offsuit. Let's go. Yep. So, But here's what happened. Yes, you'd have these random winners, these random kind of players that would be like, ah, and they would have no staying power. They'd win the World Series of Poker and really do nothing after that. But here's the interesting thing. The best of the best, even if they weren't getting the final table every year, when you looked at that top 20, top 50, now remember, these fields were ballooning up to 5,000, 6,000, 10,000 players. They were getting bigger and bigger. The best of the best players would still end up cashing and they'd still end up closer to the end. Skill was not completely negated, but variance went through the roof. Right. Now, the poker boom has receded. Uh, online gambling became illegal in certain locales. Mm -hmm. Some places are starting to re-implement it. But the poker boom as it was, by the way, there's still money in the World Series of Poker and stuff like that. You can still make money, good money. But all of a sudden, the sk average skill level has gone back up a little bit. So here's the question, for the best players, which was better? The answer is both were about the same. Right. There was more money available when the boom happened, but variance was up. So it means you could play perfect and make a mistake and, and it happens, still, whatever. Right. But when it was a smaller field, uh, you could definitely not make a mistake because all the players were better and they'd eat your lunch. That's so it's perfect, yeah. Yeah, so in reality, the skilled players would still find a way to win. Well, bring it back to sports cards. The skilled players will still find a way to win. I, up or down. I, it's, 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 it's well said. I mean, and that's a funny thing because I talked to my to my son about this all the time and we may have talked about is the guys that are making money mm -hmm. like the guys that are really really making money in sports cards you don't hear about no they're not doing youtube channels they're not doing content they're not they're sitting behind the scenes and they're exactly doing what they've always been doing they've just been adjusting their strategy going forward mm -hmm. that's and and you said it perfectly the variance change now, sometimes before it was, oh, you could be lucky or you could be good, but now you better be good because sometimes, you know, luck isn't always going to be there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And the variable that I throw in is just something that people forget. Some of the people who understand the marketing and play it aren't trying to do it to be profitable per se. They're trying to do it to break even. What do I mean? I mean, the person that is the more, if we use the sliding scale, they're more on the collector side of it. I joke on the live stream the last couple of weeks in particular, I'm having a little fun with folks. I'm like, my ROI is garbage. My ROI is way in the negatives. Here's the problem. I find plenty of good deals and I've done my flipping, but I don't do it enough to right. offset the stuff that I buy from my collection. Well, the problem is the stuff I buy in my collection, it could 2000 X. I'm not selling it. It so it means I do not gain those profits. It, it's worthless to me. Some of my best, you know, most profitable purchases are PC items that I haven't sold. So right. who cares? Right. I, I don't make a dime out of it. So in reality, I'm a horrific investor. Don't listen to me. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's a hard game. I mean, I, I go back and uh, if you ever want to, which I'm sure, go back and look at some videos from some of these guys two years ago, you know, buying lamello hoop nba hoop cards for 160 bucks grading it for 350 that's a four dollar card now a five dollar card now mm -hmm. those days are just over and people just have to realize that going forward the strategies that worked before because of everything you just mentioned perfectly are not going to work going forward but let me touch on something that we were kind of like throwing around and and what happened over the last two years for mm -hmm. sports cards? Um, I was trying to try in my head, like what what was it? How could it be defined? What and like what turn of events that occurred is going to 
change the way or the future of sports cards. And I was, I was thinking like, what could it have been? And I was talking to you about a black Swan event. And for people that don't know, a uh, black Swan event um, is from a finance professor name. I want to get it right. Nassim Talib. Mm -hmm. And he basically said it, it existed of three components and, and, and talk to each one, but it's, it's outside the realm of regular expectations because nothing in the past could point to its possibility. That's mm -hmm. one. Two, it brings an extreme impact. And despite its outlier status, people are inclined to come up, this is the best, with explanations for the event after to make it as make it pre seem predictable. Hindsight, mm -hmm. in other yep. words. So I mean, is is what we went through um cards or maybe i'm totally off base but with the pandemic not the pandemic itself because i don't that was not a black swan but because everything that happened along the way with psa dropping their grading with the advent of all these grading companies with panini starting to overproduce cards knowing that fanatics is going to be taking over the market in four years i mean nothing nothing is going to be the same but will this shake up or i guess it will but what does this mean or or is there an explanation of of this confluence of events mm -hmm. sure i think it's a good question on a side note uh what you mentioned there i do recommend if someone is interested in stuff like this do check out the book i have read it it is excellent it is a very good book it is very interesting it was written basically on the heels of the financial crisis that's mm -hmm. kind of what precipitated and it motivated the the release of it because the financial crisis in 08 was a black swan event in certain items so the, the card thing by definition is a black swan because yes pandemics and things like that they're not common let's not act like they've happened every 10 years or something no but you know these super viruses that have gone on happen with semi-regularity people should get accustomed to the idea of these things existing uh because they always have um mm -hmm. however the specific nature of it shutting down all these things at the same time of sports league shutting down at the same time mm -hmm. because in the initial act because if those for you know it, it feels like a long time ago but it isn't that long ago if you really get into it i said i started the sports Code channel at the end of 2018 so i ran at the end of 2018 all of 2019 and, and i laughed to go back and look at my 2019 goals video and see how 2020 blew it up <laughs> it was a lot of fun um but the point is that you could not have foreseen this exact scene because a lot of folks in the immediate aftermath and i'll give a quick anecdote I was actually working for a company uh, that I had started working on as a contractor. And I had only I was only about four or five months into my contract, uh, about a year. And when I went in there, um, we spent months, we were in the office and everything. And I remember uh, in March of 2020, we were there and we were actually trying to figure it out because we were watching, we were monitoring how things were going. And I had already inquired with my managers and stuff. I said, well, I got, you know, two older parents. One of them is uh, immunocompromised. You know, I got to kind of, and in order to get to work, I needed to take a, a train here and then in the subway. So it's like, that's a lot of exposure. You know, there's sure. a lot of things I got to be considerate of. So I said to them, hey, would you be all right with me uh, potentially working at our satellite office, which is actually just, you know, maybe a 20 minute drive away. So it's obviously less, less, you know, exposure to other people. I can work in mm -hmm. that remote office and we can work remotely. It's fine. We were actually discussing that on Monday of that week. Wow. By Wednesday, they're like, hey, guys, so we're going to figure out what we're going to do. By, by Thursday, they're like, hey, pack up your stuff. You're not coming back for a while. That's how fast it went. They, they, they were doing hourly meetings. You know, the, the brass was trying to figure out what right. they wanted to do. And they basically said, hey, guys, take your stuff with you, your laptop and everything. Go home. We'll figure it out and we'll let you know. I never set foot back in that office again. I finished my contract. I went full time with them. And then I went to go work for another, for a bank where I interviewed remotely. I have never set foot in the building. I have never physically met my manager or any of my coworkers. And I've been working there for eight months. This is a different world than we were just before. So you could not have predicted that in that sequence in that way, in the immediate aftermath. So as that thing was happening, the assumption was, oh, this will probably suppress markets. You know, people, there's no games on TV. You know, we don't have it going on. There's nothing right. to get excited about. Um, you had that Jordan thing with the documentary, you know, The Last Dance, but yeah. you're like, ah, oh, that's Jordan, you know, whatever, fine. Right. You, you could you could kind of cast it aside and go like, ah, whatever. It's, it's the only thing on, so people are paying attention to it. Great. But then things started to superheat for everything. It started to superheat for stuff that had nothing to do with Jordan, it had nothing to do with the documentary, and we still don't have any games going on. 
And then eventually we started getting games in a bubble and that started going on. So immediately the, the, the prevailing wisdom was that we were going to get a drop and instead we got an inc we got like a drop of like for a weekend and then, and then we started moving up it was, and, yeah. and it was exponential and we just kept moving up and up and up and up and up setting records left right and center so no you could not have predicted that you could not have sequenced it that way and you could not have assumed that the market all of a sudden people who had no business and had never gotten in the game are yeah. like oh i'm bored i'll collect cards sure whatever and that's and that's exactly but now because of that people think it was difficult to predict that cards would somehow come down mm -hmm. because they had nowhere else. And I say this before, like they had got nowhere else to go. When, mm -hmm. when you're, when you're, when it, during the craze, the, the lunacy of this with the Zion, the Luca, the Trey, mm -hmm. not when they were 99 cents or a dollar, but when they were 150 and 200 and $300 for their raw cards, not mm -hmm. their graded cards, their raw cards, they were being priced as if they did something. Mm -hmm. Okay, so before you would see the rise of cards and say, okay, this guy is now going to be going into the Hall of Fame. We'll see a jump in his card, you know, leading up to it, and then it'll level off or whatever it is. Those cards that I was just speaking about, the modern, because that's what I do, and you know that, the modern mm -hmm. basketball, is they were already priced at a point as if they won three championships, as if they were entering into the Hall of Fame. So they're all the I, I get a kick out of watching these guys come on and say, oh, it's going to drop this much. Of course it is. Of course it is. There, there's no, there was no way to sustain that. Mm -hmm. And even now, though, I will say, um, I see sometimes people say, oh, modern basketball or modern cards are dead. They're, they're not dead. None of this is dead. People have to go back further than three years and see that these cards are so far above what they were mm -hmm. then, but nowhere near what they were two years ago. That, yeah. that You know what I mean? It drives me crazy. Yeah, yeah. So, so let me give you uh, let me give you a fun example, and this is a more specific. It's a more isolated example, but I think it'll be helpful. Uh, and I'll go away from modern, just just to give people a little context. If any of you have any of those chart, you know, applications, pick market movers, pick card ladder, whichever one you prefer. It makes no difference. If any of them have have a chart that goes back beyond, you know, right. beyond a couple of years ago, go take a look at certain vintage cards. I'll give you a couple of examples, but go go and have fun, you know, at your leisure. Uh, 55 tops for Riddle Clemente. Go into a decent, reasonably high grade. Go to like a PSA 7, PSA 8. I'm just using one example. You can find plenty of others. What you're going to notice is that it was steadily going up in price. And right around 2016, it suddenly pumped way up. Like way up. Record prices compared to where it ever been. And then it precipitously dropped and dropped and dropped and dropped. And then it's only in the last couple of years, right about now, where it's almost approached the previous peak. So... How do we interpret this? Well, what happened is there was some market manipulation going on about 2016 for a lot of vintage. So vintage is not immune from market manipulation, but this predates the pandemic. It predates all this boom. But people decided they racked it up. Well, at the time, people were justifying it. They were, and th people always justify it. Mm -hmm. And even though it like, well, why did it go up so fast? Oh, well, you know, everybody's finally getting on the vintage bandwagon. Well, of course they are. I collect vintage, just to be clear. I collect vintage and I'm sitting there like, there is no bandwagon. You either like it or you don't. <laughs> like it's not right, that right. it's not that complicated, you guys. I've been collecting vintage since the mid '90s and the early '90s. You're either interested or you're not. Um, but whatever, fine. And it was out of my price range anyway. I don't care. But it was being manipulated, and it's only until now. So here's the question: If you had bought prior to 2016, you could have sold in 2016 for the market apex. You could have sold during the decline. You would have still made money, or you could sell now that they've steadily started to approach back on that previous high. So. The cost basis is more important. So how far back you go in this chart is actually the relevant figure. Because mm -hmm. if you were further back then, you were ahead during the rise, you were ahead during the fall, and you're ahead during the crescendo. Because the floor went up. Regardless, even though it went, hit this apex and dropped back down, it didn't drop back down to the previous level. I think it hovered in around, I think it apex like uh, 80, 90,000 or something like that. I forget the exact figure. And then it kind of just settled at about 30,000. But if you had gotten in prior to the run-up, I think you could have gotten for like six or seven thousand. So six or seven thousand during the down after that high, thirty thousand. Ah, oh, damn! You only five x. You're garbage. 
yeah, and now I mean, it's back around 80, 90. And, 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 and that's, that's exactly what I try to tell people. I did a video on this before where people were saying, um, you know, with the price of modern basketball, it's all, de it just depends when you buy it. If you're yeah. buying it at the right time, when people are like, well, the big thing now is I did a video on this too, was the PSA, the population count of Zion base cards. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's 20,000 and change for his PSA 10, mm -hmm. 16,000 and change for his PSA nines. And then yours about 12 or 1300 below, you know, eight, there's a four. There's a, you know, as, as Joey talk about scarcity, go after that four, there's only two of them, but it's, it doesn't matter if, if you're buying modern basketball, modern baseball, modern football, modern hockey, whatever it is, if you're buying them, and I dare I say the awful invest word, or to buy them to flip them, you shouldn't own any of them now. You just shouldn't. You're doing it wrong. When you were buying Zion, and I say this, and I, and I actually, again, and, and I'm sure you know it too when you're looking at cards. If you look at when a card hits the market, usually 30 to 45 days on a modern card, ultra-modern card, it'll hit its first floor. Now, it may hit another floor after that, depending on how it goes. But if you're looking, okay, Zion hits the market whenever it was, 30, 45 days later, you know, you could have bought his raw card for 45 or 50 bucks. You get it graded. It comes back. You, hopefully, you get a 9 or a 10. You get a 10. You sell it for three or $400, and you're happy. If, if that 20000 PSA population is mattering to you because you're holding a stack that you bought them raw at 150 and got them graded at 300 and now they're worth 550 you got to reevaluate how you're doing everything because mm -hmm. that's just not what people bring up PSA or population counts. It's great. There's a place for them. It's important. There's some, you know, cards that obviously if you're going to keep in your collection and things like that, but for base cards, population count should not matter to you unless you think you're going to keep them forever, which if you want to collect them, collect them, but not in the realm of investing, if that makes sense. Yeah. Man, yeah. Man, I think, um, I think part of the, um, and this is kind of a broader, broader thought and broader topic, but even if I put my investor hat on, because I, because I, because like I said, I'm a terrible investor because I collect too much. Like if I did a bet, if I collected less, I'd be a better investor. <laughs> my track record with stuff that I try for investment is actually okay. It's actually pretty good, but I, I like to collect. So that's where I spend mm -hmm. most of my money. However, when I do decide to dabble in, I control my cost basis. And the reason for that is I want to mitigate risk. Like if it was just, just from a conceptual standpoint, I want to mitigate risk. I'm, I'm tolerant of risk. I'm not risk averse. I'm willing to play and gamble a little bit, mm -hmm. but I pick my spots. And and I'll give you I'll give you a tangible example with a modern guy. Uh, so here in this in you know in the greater Toronto area, the GTA, our buddy uh, Vladdy Jr., our boy, mm -hmm. uh, did very well this past season. MVP candidate all the way through the end. Shohei yep. got it in the end for the narrative, pitching, batting. You know, awesome. But he was right there until the end, like you know, hanging in there, and he had a breakout season by anybody's metric. Coming out of the block though, in 2019. He was the wonderkind. He was the he was the young son of a, of a Hall of Famer. Sure. And and they saw him, and he had and he had some of his dad's propensity for hitting bad balls, and he had power and all this stuff going on. Very impressive. But he didn't come out of the blocks, gangbusters. Now I'm a baseball guy, so I'm sitting there going like, he's 19. He's he's you know he's blistered the ball at every level, but Major League Baseball the the, the pitchers are going to adapt and adjust and you oh know, sure they're gonna they're gonna eat a rookie for lunch if he's not willing to adapt. So let the kid adapt. So 2019 came and went. I think he played okay, but it was disappointing, disappointing for Wonderkin status and you know the new hotness. Well, 2020 came by. We had the pandemic shortened shortened year. Yeah. He came in. He started off in shape, but then they had to stop, and then they actually started playing, and then he was out of shape by the time they went to playing. He had another kind of like, eh, okay. But here's the thing. If you were paying attention, you would have realized, I'm seeing a little bit of development. You have to come into camp in shape, but I'm not disturbed by what I see. And I'll give you a tangible, real life thing. So 2020 rolls around. I'm looking at it going like, so you guys have declared him a bust already. I'm mm -hmm. looking at him and he's 20. 
and I'm and I saw a couple of things. I'm like, okay, I'll take a flyer again. Risk mitigation. I'm okay with it. In the beginning of 2020, I bought a stack. I started stockpiling Vladdy Jr. His prices were down. They were depressed. I started buying all kinds of stuff. I still got a stack of like 120 cards sitting in a box right now of all kinds of stuff. But I didn't just buy. I didn't buy base commons. I did a couple and I put them in a Z folio. But I also bought chrome refractors mm -hmm. i bought you know chrome uh, prism refractors i bought the x factor i had a negative refractor i had a sepia refractor i sent a couple in they came back psa 10 when you can still get them back um mm -hmm. i had those uh by the way they're still fairly low pops if you go look them up i sold them i sold them early but whatever i made sure. money on them whatever uh, but i also bought some other cards that people didn't want i'm a big fan i'm a, uh, a big fan i like the unlicensed cards i enjoy them for what they are mm -hmm. and i feel like they're good value if you're liking them as a collector and I bought a Immaculate RPA, 2019 Immaculate RPA of Vladdy Jr. That's number to 99, hard signed, on card autograph. Nice. Okay. I just sold it uh, this week on eBay. And by the way, the, the unlicensed, they still don't get a lot of love. Uh, they were trading for about 400 bucks ish I sold it for 350 to someone in Ontario here. I shipped it over. Great. 350 not too bad. No complaints there. Cool. Okay. I bought it at the end of 2020. Sorry, beginning of 2020. What was the price? What did I buy it at? This is an RPA well, of the Young Wonder Kid. Yeah. So, so of course I'm going to guess low because that's what it was. But you would think if you sold it for three fifty, a buck, buck twenty five, eighty bucks shipped. Yeah. So, yeah. I bought it for eighty bucks shipped. That's my risk. Eighty bucks. It was an on card autograph RPA of the kid out of ninety nine. I sold it for three fifty. I did fine. <laughs> Well, I, I, mean, I think that's, but that's, that's, an, that's something too, that people have to have to really think about if, if you're buying cards and I, and I, and I try to stress this too, when is enough enough? Like when, when is your profit margin? Because when I talk about in, a, in another video, I talk about people ask me, is it worth grading a card? It's like, a, it's like a loaded question. Is it worth grading a card at a hundred dollars? Sure. And I and I go through the. It's a very simple formula, okay. You take the cost of the card, the cost of the grade, and if you can get a consistent PSA nine price, that's thirty percent more than the cost of the card and cost of the grade, you should be okay. But it's a loaded question because I don't know if you know how to evaluate a card for grading. Mm -hmm. So if it's not going to get a ten or a nine. Then you you shouldn't grade any cards unless mm -hmm. they're they're older cards or you know that you know it's a six or a five or whatever ultra modern cards. If you can't get a ten or a nine consistently, mm -hmm. don't grade the card because an eight is going to give you probably the price of raw or lower. To get back to what you were saying, you made that eighty five dollar investment, so you forexed your money, mm -hmm. give or take. That's terrific i can't ask for anything more than that it's because you know you're not going to buy a card for 10 bucks and sell it for 100 or whatever it is not like the old days it's it's getting your your risk correct and then knowing when to get rid of the card yeah and of course so just so we've got all the angles covered you know there's going to be the person who's going to say but what if you you know what if again they got their labor issues to work out fine sure. but for the sake of argument and of course we've got the new variant and all that, but let, let's for the sake of argument let's pretend they play on time april rolls around and they're playing baseball again and he cares to cover off the ball right oh but won't because this is a true thing a real issue with folks oh but won't you regret if he comes out if he comes out super hot and the price goes up and whatever it's like well number one i forexed and if and by the way in about a year and change it wasn't mm -hmm. really about a year uh, but number two, I said I stockpiled. How many cards right. did I tell you I sold? The one. Yeah, I sold the one. Well, and I told you I sold the RPA out of 99. Did I mention I have the RPA at a 49? Right. Did, did I mention that I have multiple versions of some of his other rookies, which I bought, by the way, the RPA at a 49 and the one out of 99, the two of them combined cost basis wise, is less than I just sold the 99 out of. The 49 might as well be house money right now because I own it for free. And that's the whole thing. It's it's like when – look, it's the same thing. We're going back to it. I know it's beating a dead horse. But a $50 Zion comes back as a PSA 10 a year and a half ago, and you sell it at five or $600. 
Do I have regrets that I could have waited three months and sold it for 900? Not when I graded that this many and did it and go and I have, you know, like you said, I don't, I'm not interested in those cards. I'm interested in like the, the select, you know, to 33 behind me or, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. That's different. That's mm -hmm. different. So everyone has to just make those choices and not look back. You just have to know and try to figure out the best way that suits you. Because like you said, I, I can't, I can't understand people saying, I'll hold it till it hits this much because guess what? You could hold it and it won't hit that much. It could go the other way. Mm -hmm. Then you're just left holding a bunch of, you know. What that tells me though, is it tells me that that person didn't actually have a plan because they didn't actually. Now, by the way, strategies can change. Information changes, you know, the climate changes. You got to be adaptable. You can't, you can't lock into a strategy permanently with no, with no ability to adapt to what happens. But in the example of what I did when I was doing that stockpiling it, I have, I am going to keep some Vladdy Jr. cards for mm -hmm. sure, because I enjoy watching him play for the Jays. It's fun for me. Great. But I don't want 120 of them. I don't need 120 of them, but I picked up certain ones because I felt like the value was there. And I said, okay, at the time it's great. By the way, I'm willing to keep all of them. It doesn't make any difference to me. However, over the course of this, over the course of the off season, I will probably put a couple more up on eBay at prices that are reasonable. I don't need top of the market right. because every single time I sell one that it sells, I'm going to make money on it. Mm -hmm. And the more times I make money on it, there's going to come a day where if I've sold successfully enough of them, I'm going to be sitting with a collection of a couple of fun Vladdy Jr. cards that at that point have a $0 cost basis for me. And I basically have a collection for free and I've gotten my money back and I probably made some money, not crazy amounts, not as much as I could have if he takes off, but that's why I'm still going to have a couple. I'm not going to sell all my rarest ones necessarily, but I will sell a couple of them just to get the money sure. in it. But also I've got other projects, other things I want to collect, other things mm -hmm. that I want to do. So just letting the money just sit there, it's like, it's not a bank account. It doesn't appreciate it unless it actually appreciates. And if I don't convert it, then it's actually worthless. Then you've got cardboard. Right. No, then, and I love then cardboard. it's just, right. And, it's, and baseball to me is fascinating. And I, I'll, I look, I, I am the first one to admit, I'm a one trick pony. I love basketball. I love the the, the draft, like the, the new kids. I like, I like, to me, it's fun because I like speculation. Now, speculating wasn't hard two years ago. I mean, you had Kyle Guy. You're, you're, you know, he, he, he made, you know, he was going to make you money. Now it's a little bit more. I like, but I like that whole aspect. And I know people that work around the NBA and they're, you know, coaches and they're scouts. And I just love gathering the information. Baseball to me, though, that's a different animal because baseball is like one of these. You, I see people spending like lots of money on baseball cards of kids that haven't even got to the major leagues. I, I can't grasp that. To me, they're, that you, is, they're spending a lot of money on players that haven't made it to AAA. <laughs> I, I think, was it? Was it, I know? And again, I'm going to mention some players that I heard. Of course, Dominguez was was one. Yeah, yeah, Jason Dominguez. Yeah, right. Bobby Witt Jr. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Um. Uh, Duran, I think, or but the name sounds familiar. It, it, the great irony is that even though I follow baseball and I've picked up different players, I wait until they make the major leagues. I didn't touch, even though Vladdy Jr. all the way through the minors, he was, you know, he was touted. I didn't touch him until he got to the major leagues. I actually want to see what you do against major league pitching. That's why I care. It's like, no, I actually want to see. That's why I say I was comfortable with it because it's like, I see some progress. Uh, if you come into if you come into camp in shape, we'll see what happens. That right. that my thought process is, um, and this is the way I would present it. I don't pretend I'm a scout. I'm not. I don't pretend I'm going to sit there and, and do all the advanced analytics. I don't. I don't even like war. I don't like any of that crap. However, as a as a lifelong baseball fan, I can look at a swing. I obsess about the hitting side of the game. I obsess mm -hmm. about it. So I know what I like. I know what my eye tells me. Okay. So I'll keep that in the back of my mind. If I see it, I'll know it when I see it. When I see it, that doesn't no. guarantee it's going to work. Right. right. Because the other guy that I love is Soto because I love his swing and I love all this. He could tear his ACL and his career is over and that's the end of that. But I like what I see. With him, I see it. With Vladdy Jr., I see the potential of it if he keeps the diet in check. But it's always an if. You never know. By the way, that's no guarantee. 
Zero <laughs> percent guarantee. No, there's 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 no guarantee. The one player that I bought and um, our friend uh, Jordan from Sports Card Analytics, he told me because he goes all the games and he has some friends that that he he's really really into it. And uh, he said, look, I'm telling you about a guy. If you want to buy him, buy him. If not, don't buy him. But I'm telling you about a guy that, that I think has a shot. And it was uh, Luis Roberts. Yeah, Luis Robert. Yeah. Right, Luis Robert. And um, I that's the only guy that I, I did. And I have some of him. And hopefully he'll continue on his trajectory to, to greatness. There you go. So, it's fun, though, to watch these guys grow. You never know. No, I mean that's the whole thing. I mean, there's there's kids that there's a kid for the Phillies that um that I I don't know. I like him. I like Alex Bohm. I mean, he Alec was Bohm, yeah. up for a while, and now he's down again. Now he's, you know, they're talking like maybe he'll come up this year, and maybe he'll you know he'll do well. Um, uh, I think Mayton is another kid that they have that that the uh, the Phillies like. So I I don't know. I mean, it's yeah. it's they're kids. I mean, One thing I would recommend for folks if they want to play in the baseball realm, there's two things you need to understand. Number one, baseball is very stable, relatively speaking. Yes, there are jumps. Most of the time, they're not as dramatic because the 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 line is so long. To your point, the prospects start off like three years before they hit the majors or four years before they hit the majors. So it's like you're just sitting around waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting until they actually start playing. I mean, they're signing contracts at a high school, right? Yeah. And the guys at the Dominican and some of the Latin countries, they're probably like 12 and they're signing them. So it's like, I'm sorry, you're waiting. <laughs> you need to keep. So, but what I do recommend is even when the young guys, the, the reason why I gave Vladdy Jr. so much room is that I looked at him. He started, he started playing in the major leagues in 19. I'm like, patience, my young Padawans, patience. It's good. To, but by the way, though, I didn't mind the panic selling. I bought the no. panic selling, Andy. I bought the panic selling. Yeah, that's that to me was a interesting phenomena that we went through with again basketball because that's that's all. Sure, I yeah, think. yeah. It was like this guy gets hurt and his cards drop off a cliff, and I'd be like, great, because he's going to come back. He's not done for his season, so or for the, his career. So you know, you you, you know, it was. I guess the best way to say it was, have you ever seen anything more reactionary than the market over the last two years? Mm -hmm. Over everything. Yeah. Documentary. I was selling the, the Michael Jordan cards that were like worthless. Mm -hmm. 30 bucks, 25 bucks, 50 bucks. Crazy. Uh, you know, this comes out. This guy hits a buzzer beater. This guy does this guy. Those days... I think we'll tell our, our, you know, I'll tell my grandkids about that. You can tell your kids about that. It's like, I remember when you could buy a card for six bucks on a Tuesday and sell it for 70 on a Friday. And those. Mm. Uh, so let me ask you this before we, uh, before we wrap it up. Sure. Where do you see um, content creation going forward? Do you see, um, do you see this continue to have these new, new people come in and talk about stuff or, do you think we're going to revert back to like the the OGs and these and a lot of these guys are just going to kind of do it? Some are. I mean, unfortunately, mm -hmm. some are. But right. So I think the best way to put it, a little bit of it is going to depend on what happens with that market. If it does rebound, then so be it. There'll still be some folks. I think there'll still be some new folks coming in and trying to add their voices to the masses. Um, whether they're capable of. Um, having the holding power is going to be part and parcel of what happened. The audience is affected by these markets too, right? Right. So if you're like in the analytics top five category, well, then things need to be going okay. Otherwise, everybody's picks are bad and no one's going to listen to you anyway. If you're providing some kind of commentary or something and maybe you bring some table, maybe you have a great personality or you, whatever, some combination mm -hmm. they're in. That's why I said YouTube is great because guess what? You can either inform, you can entertain. And if you can do both, it's even better. But if you can do one of the two well, then you're gold. It doesn't matter. It doesn't make a difference. The OG, some of the OGs will stick around, but some of the OGs may fade away just because they may lose interest. Or they may just not have the game to be able to adapt. Because mm -hmm. just being an OG, I enjoy listening to some of them talk about some of the stuff, but sometimes they get stuck. They've only got one theme. So every video is basically the same video. Well, that's not going to cut it. We're too, there is a dynamic element to it. I like doing evergreen stuff because it's a lot of fun mm -hmm. and, it, and it's and it's sustainable. And I can say, Hey, go check out my video from six months ago or a year ago. 
right, still right. applicable. The concept's still applicable. Like the rules haven't changed. I get, I kept it very straightforward for that reason. But I can also talk about topical stuff. This year was very, very good for yeah, having a lot I, of news I, to talk it's, about. It's, it's, I, feel, I am so jealous of guys like you and, uh, and uh, Dakota and, and Dustin. And, because I, it's funny because I'm like, okay, something happens. And then I know that one of you guys are going to come out and you're going to give an informed opinion about it right away. And it's what I look for because I get a lot of stuff. In fact, sometimes, I mean, there's no – I'll get something. I'll send it to Dustin. I'll send it to you because I know you guys will will be able to react in real time, mm -hmm. and I think that's very informative too. Because we're like, well, what does this mean? Or what does this happen? Sometimes we react to something and we just don't know because it's so new and it's so fresh. But mm -hmm. I think that's one of the great things about YouTube is people can come, they can learn, they can pick out the people. And I always tell them this, and obviously you're one of them is. Find the people that you can go to to actually learn from some, you know, learn, learn, get the information and evaluate it because that's what this hobby is all about. If we don't have someone, if we don't, if we can't learn and we can't evolve, then we're just going to go nowhere. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now I'll throw this one at you. This is so. Let me ask you kind of a question, and we can sure. uh, we can kind of uh, use your show, so we can wind her down on that if you want. But I yeah. think it's a fun one, and this okay. is the other little Easter egg that I'll leave for your audience that you can okay. have a little fun with. It's always been one of my favorite things. Uh, the conversation piece that the hobby is getting smarter is my personal favorite. So in my live stream, I like to snarkily reply that it's not, but I genuinely believe it's not. On average, it's not getting any smarter because human intelligence hasn't gotten any smarter. Mm -hmm. But here's something I want to throw at. I, I want to ask you what your opinion is on this, but I'm also going to throw out a little a little piece that's a new one that I will okay. steadily roll out in 2022. So you're getting it ahead of time. You're getting okay. in advance. Sneak peek. When I look at the when I look at the argument for the hobby getting smarter, telling people that the hobby is getting smarter, and usually the justification given is that we have more data analytics tools, we have more data mm -hmm. available, we can look up comps and do all this. Therefore, people are smarter. Using that as your argument is the equivalent of saying that people, human beings are smarter because we have Google. It doesn't matter that we have Google. It doesn't matter that you can look things up. Not everybody knows how. Not everybody understands how to use the information properly. Not everyone knows how to figure out a good piece of information from a bad piece of information or interpret it. So the fact that you have Google doesn't mean you're any smarter. In fact, you may be dumber and maybe using Google as a crutch. Similarly, you may be using a data analytics tool as a crutch for a lack of knowledge. You look at a chart and think you understand what the chart means. No, you don't. You don't know what precipitated that chart. You have no underlying knowledge to be able to make any assertions to it. You're just guessing. But the chart looks nice. It's pretty. You're it's, not any smarter than you were before. I agree 100%. I, I, I actually, uh, I, Dakota did a video with Sports Card Anonymous. Um, sure. I'm going to be on his show. Well, I don't know. By the time you see this, I'll probably already have been on his show. But mm -hmm. he did a thing about the hobbies getting smarter. You know, he, he was talking about that. And I, and, I, and I emailed him. I said, watch my video because I'm taking it a different way. Yeah, yeah. I don't think they're getting smarter at all. There's just less people, number one. So those people that were, dare I say, not as smart, have left the hobby, mm -hmm. the money that they had is no longer here. And it's it's part of the adjustment. And what you're saying is 100% right. I can, I have, you know, I look at market movers, I look at card ladder, I look at eBay. Mm -hmm. But if, if they're just numbers, if you don't know what you're looking for, for mm -hmm. me specifically, when I'm interested in a card, I will look and study it. I know from the past, how many days goes by before it should hit the bottom or hit the floor, or what it should be or what I should offer. But you're hundred percent right. If you, Google doesn't make you smart, 100%. No, yeah. I, I, I think that, I think that's, that's, it's, yeah, I don't, I don't, I do not think the hobby is smarter. I think there's just less people to, I don't want to say anything I'll get in trouble for because you know me and I don't like to say anything I get in trouble for, but Let's just say it's not getting smarter. Yeah. And I think the thing is that everybody, um, I like to read a lot of financial books. And there's mm -hmm. one that I have sitting on my shelf that I have to get back to. And it's, and it's a beautiful book. The title of it is perfect for the situation. The title is This Time is Different. Mm -hmm. Because it's one of the favorite themes. And the book itself goes into a history of different financial calamities 
and different financial issues. And every single time, everybody says, no, 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 guys, this time is different. It's always this time is different. Every single time until we have hindsight and they're like, actually, it wasn't different. It was basically the same. And the other piece of it, touching on what you just said, what about the people we don't hear from? Right. During the run-up, what about the people that were buying and selling and didn't know what they were doing and doing that? They're not on YouTube. And th that's why I, I caution everybody. This is just a general piece. I caution mm -hmm. you. Do not get into an echo chamber. Do not assume that because your friends around you may be smarter uh, per capita. Do not assume because you went to the card show and had some good conversations with some level-headed people and now you're convinced that this is the hobby populace. My experience says, no, it's not the hobby populace. It is a very specific subset of people. You tend to not surround yourself with people that are dumb. You try not to. And if you manage that, you're going to think, oh, people must be smart. No, as soon as I go outside this door, I'm going to I'm going to be able to point out to you. No, they're not smarter because they're not smarter in life. Why would they be smart in the hobby? What are you I, talking I don't, about? It's, it's, oh boy. You know, you, you bring up a lot of people and I, I wish I had a, especially in the beginning of the, I would say the boom of the mm -hmm. content creation. I'm one of them. I, I, I admit it. I, I came on because I stopped doing what I was doing. My son said, you know, go out and do it. And that's, that's fine. But during that boom, you had so many content creators coming on. Mm -hmm. And I made a joke. I said, people do the research by watching these content creators. Yes. That's not the way. And, and if you had a dollar or a dime for every time you heard a content creator say, here's what you should do, but make sure you do your own research. That just, that, that was like the catchphrase of, because no one was doing their own research or the guy or the people, the new people were doing their own research by saying, you know, this is the hottest thing, go buy this or go buy that. And I think the, um, the one of the things that I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with and Carlos, please chime in is just because someone says something is new and hot and going to be the next best thing doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So just be careful before you jump into these. I won't call them fads, but there's some things that are, that are going out there now that I would be very careful before you jumped in. Make sure there's water in the pool before you jump in because that's the mm -hmm. best way to say it. Yeah, no, that's fair. And the only thing I'll piggyback off of that as well is that we shouldn't assume automatically, and I try to be very fair about this, I'm not going to assume that some of those hobby influencers and folks are intentionally trying to lead you astray. Right. I'm not going to assume that because that's unfair. We don't know what their intentions are. Sometimes it's more transparent than others, but for the sake of argument, let's assume they're all trying to tell you the closest to the truth that they're capable of, mm -hmm. their interpretation of the truth but it doesn't mean they have the knowledge basis to be able to do it. A lot of people are just very trusting. Um, if I may, to my own horn for something to refer back people, you know, this is your homework. Mm -hmm. Back in the summer of 2020, I was killing it with videos, Andy. I was killing it. Uh, my personal favorite that plays into exactly what you said a couple of minutes ago is I did a video that was literally called Hobby Influencers and the Hobby Feedback Loop. Mm -hmm. I did a beautiful little chart and everything. But it's on the idea of exactly what you said earlier. It's that where the person regurgitates the information, someone takes it and acts upon it, therefore creating a data point that then shows up in the data tool. Somebody else just reading the data tool. They're being honest. They're not, there's no agenda. They're just reading the data tool, seeing a trend, telling you about the trend, and then you're influenced by the trend to then act, another data point, somebody else reports on it, another data point. It's a loop. It just keeps going in circles and circles. It's a feedback loop. It, by definition, it's a feedback loop. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, this plays out all the time. By the way, it didn't get invented in this hobby boom. Right. This, this feedback loop is always existed, but now it's easier. Now I can share it with you on Instagram. I can share it with you on Twitter. I can share it with you on YouTube video. It goes viral. People watch it. Now they're convinced. Every single one of the fads that we can talk about in the hobby came because somebody decided to put it out there enough times that somebody else picked up on it and somebody else picked up on it. More people picked up on it. More people watched it. More people decided to make videos on it. And the cycle begins again. It's from July 2020. We're into almost in 2022. Guys, I could just keep playing. Can I just replay the same video over and over again for you? <laughs> it doesn't change. It's that's what was going on, and that's what it does. It does. You're 100% right. You're 100% right. I just need to replay myself. I don't even need to do any more videos, Andy. I'm just going to replay my own videos in perpetuity. Yeah. That's going to be my channel now. It's, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there before <laughs> I, I, I insert my, you know, but. I, I just want to thank you, Carlos, for coming. And I just want to let you know that it was the honor of having you on 
my last show. Big announcement, my last show there you of go. 2021. Well, you might be able to do it in perpetuity if you do it right. I already explained. Well, you There's the a model. One, you were the one, and I will say this, for those of you who don't know, um, when I did my, my, my famous, I guess as far as a, a video that would go viral in this space, mm -hmm. I think it had sure. like 10,000 views or something like that. So I do Which is thank, strong, by the way. I, I've been I consistent, do, but you've gotten more views off that than any of my hobby <laughs> stuff. So I, I do have it. to thank, um, uh, was it? I think it was, my, I want to say it was Mike. Is it baseball? It would be Mike, baseball collector. I think who did a response to it. Yeah, I think that was. So, I think that helped. Yeah. So, so I'll, I'll end it with this because this this would be my the my the, the the thing that really it was it was it was it was a blessing in disguise because I met mm -hmm. so many great people. But I did that video on the national, and then I was at a job and I get a call um, from no, it was I think it was Jordan. He says. Dude, you're not going to believe this, but someone just did a um, reaction video to your video. And I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah. I don't know what that was. Yeah. And your just, son was excited about this, right? Yeah, he was ecstatic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's, so so I'm like, uh, he's like, dude, yeah, he's he's playing it and he's commenting on it. He's like, mm -hmm. dude, I'm like, I'm like, okay, whatever. So I called my son. I go, Ty, Jordan called. He goes, I go, check this out. This guy's doing a reaction to our video and my son's there that's awesome i'm like mm -hmm. yeah but he's not going to be very you know he's not going to be very uh complimentary although it was fair yeah. he's yeah, not yeah. going to be very complimentary on it but my son was was ecstatic but then it just took off because everyone was like oh who is this guy we'll go get him. like the, the pitchfork and torches and mm -hmm. we'll go get him and um you reached out almost instantaneously said hey come on the show and talk about this and we did yeah. and then i did another video which in retrospect was one of the best things I ever did because everyone who commented on Mike's video, mm -hmm. I went and looked at them and they almost all had channels yeah. and I watched each and every one of their channels and they were all passionate baseball guys. I have a relationship with a lot of them because I talked to them back and forth and mm -hmm. it, it was, a, what was it called? a blessing in disguise at the yeah. time. It wasn't real fun, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it turned out it turned out just fine so but get a roundabout way that was when we talked about it because then i could have done a reaction to the reaction of the reaction video so we would then have the infinite content loop which it's the dream it's the dream andy the infinite content loop is the is moi chef's kiss and you can't you you came up with that and i'm like it would be a never-ending form of content well, you asked earlier name. about the future of content, Andy. We've got re endlessly replayable the exact same thing over and over again, and the infinite content loops. Andy, we got videos for days, man. I, I joke around like that because because I could I could see it. It's like PSA comes out with it, and then you get like you know Neo will say it, you go uh, mm -hmm. Dustin, blah, 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 all having your own little take on it, and then we can like, react to each other. And that's it. You should we should. I was thinking I shouldn't say this out loud because <clears throat> someone will steal it for sure, mm -hmm. but. Wouldn't it be fun to do a uh, like a talk soup of <laughs> okay. sports card content? Yeah, I mean, probably. You could probably manage that. Could you imagine, right? So, like, well, to know, be honest, some of the live streams, you know, start to approach that. It, it's because because the panel thing, and, and you know, we'll, we'll we'll button it off on this. But just the, when you did the video and the reaction to it, I understood that there was an opportunity there for multiple fronts. I was like, sure. no, come on and chat. Um, on my live stream, I like having the conversations. It's fun. And by the way, usually we end up talking beyond the scope of the original oh, thing. Yeah. I, I never bring somebody on. It's like, I'm not going to ask you to talk about the one thing. No, no, no. Let, get opinions on something else. Let's have some fun. Let's let's chat. Well, that was it's the a, fun thing, too, because if I remember correctly, when I was on with you, a lot of the guys yeah. that were commenting came into the live stream. Yeah. And we started having a conversation back and forth, and it was fantastic. But no, and, and that's one thing that you do. For the, for those of you who do not, and I cannot imagine any of you who do not, check out <clears throat> Because I'm Carlos, Friday nights, 9 o'clock. Eastern, He yep. does a live stream with his good friend, Bobby Burrell, who is mm -hmm. such an excellent resource for hockey and just, just a really, really good guy. Um, it's your I'll call your unofficial sidekick because yeah my well I, I don't think it'll, i don't think it'll want to be called a sidekick but a co-host we'll say co unofficial co-host unofficial co-host <laughs> i'm sure we'll be thrilled no leave that in leave you know <laughs> andy's son leave that in 
leave that in. I'll send that it to out. Bobby. It'll be wonderful. Please leave that in. I didn't yeah, say it. Leave that in. I'll I'll hear the uh, I won't hear the end of it. But check check out Carlos. He is going to get you caught up on anything that's happened in that past week on I'll card try. content. He's going to have some guests. He's going to play some live videos. He'll react to Sometimes, it. Yeah. It's it's just it's just a blast. I mean, and if you don't catch it on live, which is is more fun for sure. <laughs> excuse me catch it on the replay but carlos i want to thank you so much this will be my last show of the new year i couldn't think of a better person to to spend some time with and shoot the you know what with i appreciate it you're always welcome so for everyone else until next time take care <laughs>